Well, you think about, uh, you know, I think about my daughter and she was, you know, talk, thinking about careers and stuff like that. And I'm not sure where I heard it, but, you know, it's not my thought, but it, I, it resonated with me and it, it relates to this. I said, if, if you want to be valuable, if you want to have a career and earn money, find a problem and solve it. And here we go again. Uh, against the odds, it doesn't take a genius. Here are Mark and Mike. Ramsey! Marshall, it is such a pleasure to see you, and I promise I'm not turning this into the Booker T. Washington podcast, but I, but I kind of want to. I'm going to be honest. It's 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 going to be a mini series at this point. <laughs> you know. Probably will. <laughs> yeah. You know, so this is uh, Booker T. Washington part two. Right. <laughs> and nice. and there could easily be twa and so on. I mean, it's it's uh man like. Re just reading his autobiography up from slavery has uh, been so in inspirational and I keep coming up with new things he talks about that he he has a whole chapter basically on how to give a speech you know how to present to people it's phenomenal like it's just phenomenal so I, I could go on and on and and uh but there was one that was just so good I wanted to to bring it to uh, our podcast today so well that's I, it's awesome yeah I, I I after we talked about him I looked up you know because you know heaven forbid i ever do pre-show work but <laughs> after we record the episode i'm like who was this guy and i looked around and one of the things that struck me was you're talking about his oratory skills yeah. um, he went out and raised basically the modern day equivalent of 45 million dollars uh to build these uh, rural community schools and yes. and the institute and stuff like that and i'm like 45 million yeah that's uh even to, yeah, that's uh, that's a lot of change. And and by the way, did it with a commitment that he would never say anything in the north that he wouldn't say in the south, and vice versa. So mm -hmm. you know, go, going through the era that he went through of Reconstruction and you know all, all the nastiness, he still felt like he was able to thread a line of uh, you know he he really tried to be a conciliator and 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 that got him a little bit in trouble. He was a little bit controversial for. You know, the fact that, you know, he uh, was trying to make friends with whites, if I could put it that nakedly. Um, it's just stunning, just stunning to to hear his story. And, and it's certainly a story for the modern era, for our time. I mean, it, it, it's just over and over again. So, yeah, tre tremendous lessons. And, uh, yeah, his philosophy of, of education and entrepreneurship is the is the vehicle uh to to raise yourself in society i mean it, yeah it was just it, yeah inspiring today as it, as, as i'm sure it was then at 100 percent. and so so i wanted to talk about one of those little entrepreneurial moments today that just caught me uh it sort of it, it gets uh, about half a chapter in up from slavery and um it's about making bricks he uh he had his uh his students make the bricks so so I'm, I'm going to give you the story and then we can kind of talk about some uh, some insights here. But if, I, I don't know what the title of this episode is going to be, but I, I think it if if we wanted to be clickbaity, it's something along the lines of the three things Booker T. Washington had that allowed him to overcome everything else. Have so much adversity. And he had three things here in, in the brick making story to me that that show uh, you know, how he was able to do what he was able to do. So if you're a person listening to this who is trying to accomplish something, maybe uh, some sort of big picture thing with your organization, a change you'd like to see in your in your market, uh, in your employee base, uh, we, we've got a story for you. So so that's what I want to do today, if you're cool with that. Oh, I'm excited to, to hear it. Yeah, and I, I think there's a merit into what you're about to talk about uh, that yeah, definitely could be applied to the here and now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 my goal. So, um, but it's a great story anyway. So, uh, just to put it in perspective, 1881 is when Booker T. Washington gets called to lead the Tuskegee Institute, this brand new, uh, somewhat government-funded uh, school in Alabama, and uh, he made a commitment up front that he was going to have the students build the buildings. Um, and he he said in, in the course of that, that the most trying experience of all of that was the brick making. So 
so so here's here's the story uh basically it starts with him realizing you know like it, he doesn't say the word irony but he, he does say sympathy he said he always had sympathy with the israelite slaves who you know were making bricks without straw when pharaoh made him make the bricks without straw uh, in the book of exodus in the bible and uh, he said except we did it without money and without experience <laughs> So, you know, he he does appreciate the irony. And of course, people were telling him not just about bricks, but about the buildings themselves. You know, he was getting advisors saying, hey, uh, you need to use people with experience. You need to use experts, uh, you know, uh, and, and you can see why, you know, you're going to have issues with the building having mistakes in the in the construction and they won't be very comfortable and the finish won't be there. And um, and he basically just said, well, and, and this will be a theme you'll notice. Um, the, the quote was, teaching of civilization, self-help, and self-reliance would be better than having perfect buildings, and and those mistakes would teach us valuable lessons for the future. So, uh, so you know, civilization, self-help, self-reliance, he thought that that was worth the price. Um, but here's the deal. The price is pretty high anyway. I mean, even if they didn't build these buildings well, brick making is extremely hard. You know, they had to find a, a, a place to have a, a, a brick making, uh, you know, a, a, a mud pit, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially a mud pit. So hard, dirty work. Um, he had all these students showing up who came for a book education. I mean, some of them coming, he, he makes a point that some of them came like with, you know, Latin and Greek grammars, you know, and knew some stuff and were ready to further that so they could go be a teacher somewhere and not have to do manual labor. And here he is saying, yeah, well, we're going to build this house, guys. And uh, they, you know, it was awful. So he talks about, you know, book education versus spending hours at a time up to your knees in mud in this mud pit. Um, he had students leave the school, like literally just they said, yep, I'm out. Um, so round one, they mold 25,000 bricks and the bricks fail because the kiln was not properly constructed and, and they weren't properly fired. Round two, they build a second kiln. And all he says about it is that it also failed, quote, for some reason, unquote. Like they don't even know how or why, you know, they, they can't diagnose the problem, but somehow it fails. Well, now the students are getting even more uh, resistant to the work and and in fact, at this point in in the creation of Tuskegee and and you know its legacy, all, he says almost every new student was coming to the school with a parent sending a letter or accompanying them, saying, "Look, I only want them to get a book education. I'm 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 not wanting them to get a manual labor education or a you know any trade skill. I just just a book education, okay?" And so he kind of ignored that um, and basically just kept on task. And and the only way he was able to get a, a third kiln built was that he had teachers um, who helped out. So the teachers volunteered to help him, him build this thing. Um, that third kiln in the middle of the night collapsed. So now he's got uh, no money left to build any kiln. And he remembers that he has this watch that he had been given or something. And uh, he uh, rides into Montgomery, Alabama to uh, pawn it. He gets 15 bucks. That's enough to restart the efforts. Um, and the fourth kiln worked. And so so here's the happy ending. Um, as of the writing of, of Up From Slavery, which I think is around the turn of the century, I think it was published in 1901, but it was, it was published in a newspaper uh, before that. So sometime around the turn of the century, he says that the season before they made 1.2 million bricks at Tuskegee, 1.2 million bricks. He says they're first class bricks. You could sell them in any market. They're so high quality. Um, and he has this quote, scores of young men have mastered the brick making trade, both the making of bricks by hand and by machinery, and are now engaged in this industry in many parts of the South. So 1.2 million bricks made there countless other bricks made elsewhere in the South by students who are employable. Um, and, uh, and oh, by the way, the, the buildings that these students produced and, and created, 
Uh, they were incredibly protective of them. If they saw like a younger, newer student, like tempted to do graffiti, they're like, whoa, 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 I built this building. Don't you mess it up. Uh, so they had this pride on campus. And um, as of the writing of the autobiography, he says that, you know, they were 19 years into the school's existence and there were 40 buildings on campus, all but four were wholly built with student labor. And I'm talking like down to the electric fixtures being installed and everything. So um, just completely student labor. So so that's the story. And, and I guess, Mike, what I want to ask you is, which part would have uh, made you despair the most? And I and I tried to make a list as I went through reading this. You know, your 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 own counselors push back and say, "I don't think this is a good idea." You know, would I have quit then? Um, you know, you you make twenty five thousand bricks and the whole effort gets wasted because of faulty you know uh, uh, you know construction. Would that wasted effort have just crushed me? Um, with the second kiln where I don't even know how or why it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I, I don't even know at this point. I can't even diagnose what the problem is. Would I have given up there? And personally, that's the one where I would have given up. I would have stopped there. Um, the, the accident, you know, the third kiln just collapses, you know, in the middle of the night. But dang it, you know, like fortunes against us here. And and then the students, you know, just giving up and saying, you know, I'm not bought in. I'm 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 giving up. You know, you keep going. You know, feel free to lead in front, but I'm I'm going to sit this one out. I I don't know which of those would have you know been worse uh, for him personally, uh, but that man, that one where you just don't even know why it's not working, you know, that would have caused me to give up. So I don't know your thoughts there. Oh, that's it's frightening. It it uh, yeah, we have a rule in my house. Uh, my daughter can repeat it back to you. Uh, the first time you do anything, it doesn't go all that particularly well. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then the second half is, but we don't quit. Yeah. Yeah. The first time we do something, it doesn't go all that well, but we, we, we keep trying, right? The second right. time will go better. Third time will right. go better. You know, it'll, it'll get better. In this case, nope. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> nope, nope. We did it. We did it four times. I think the, the most, it would have been the most discouraging and probably the most motivating. Uh, you know, we've had uh, off off air conversations about the, my disappointment with professionals. Yes, and, and so so that fourth round when we got the professionals and we got the teachers involved, right? We're now now we'll get it done. Yeah, and then they failed. And then they failed. Yeah. So I would have been incredibly disappointed. Like, oh. You know, that would have been a relief. Like, all right, I'm going to turn it over to some experts here. And then they failed. And then, yeah, I would double down on determination and be like, all right, I'm going to show you clowns that yeah. even somebody who doesn't know what they're doing is going to be able to make this work despite your, you know, your reputation there or your, you know, that should be able to pull this off. Yeah. So, so yeah, that would have been the most disappointing and the most motivating all at the same time. So it's like, all right, I'm going to prove I can do this, even if the, the smart people can't. Well, it, it's interesting how you answered that, because what I've been sort of thinking about what makes this an episode is that I, you know, like I said, I think there are three things here that he had going for him that allowed him to overcome all these obstacles, and, and they apply to us today. And, um, and, and the, the way I'm describing it is the who, the how, and the why. And, uh, and, and you just hit on the who a little bit there. You know, I've got some allies here. I've got some folks who um, are, are, are coming alongside me. These are, these are folks who buy in and, and, and can, you know, pull the weight with me and, and help me get this thing over the finish line. And, um, and even when it breaks down, he still got them as allies. You know, they, they know that they're going to make this, this happen. Um, and, and, you know, on try four on kill number four, they make it succeed. Uh, but if, yeah, if he hadn't had them, I think, you know, there's no way he could have done this on his own as every, every student quit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and if you think about this now, if this model was still employed, mm -hmm. you know, and you talk about the high dropout rate, you right. know, the kids who are coming to get a book education. Yep. Uh, yeah. All right. So we weed out the kids who are less than committed. And and at this point, right, we, you look at, you know, how higher education has is, is gone too far. And the, the country is now short tradesmen of all types, so, yep. you know, plumbers, pipe fitters, electricians, machinists, welders, uh, mechanics, yep. you know, carpenters. We don't we don't have any of these people now. Yep. 
man, how much cooler would it have been if college had included learning a trade along with academia? Well, since you've already gone there, let me go ahead and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, the who. I think you have to have some allies that buy in. And, and the way he uh, he talks about it, it, it's in two ways. He actually had the founders of the school who who got it established. My, my understanding is there was a politician who said, hey, local black freedman who has a trade and is well-respected in the community, if you can get your community to vote for me and get me an office in this black majority area, I'll make sure you all get a school. So that's how Tuskegee started was some money from from the state of Alabama, but promised because of, you know, basically they they had a political alliance here. The the black freedman, and I'm sorry, I forget the name of the gentleman, um, he and a former slave owner, a white guy, are the ones who really had this commitment to black education. So it's the two of them that actually end up sending a letter to uh, find out uh, if if this uh, this gentleman that they knew um, had any any recommendations for somebody to run the school. And he's the guy who recommends Booker T. Washington. So so you've got the founders of the school backing him up. And then you've got these these teachers. Um, by the way, the teachers also educated at the same school that Booker T. Washington was educated at. Oh, by the way, also, that was the guy, the guy who ran the, that school is the one who recommended Booker T. for the position at Tuskegee. And so so I have to tell you, now we're talking about the how, because all of these individuals, uh, the who's, um, really bought into the how, which was the model taught at the Hampton Institute. So, uh, so the Hampton Institute in Virginia uh, was... Um, was where Booker T. Washington was trained. It was it, it did teach practical skills along with the education. There was sort of this idea that work gives you discipline and moral fiber, and and oh by the way, you're contributing to society. And I can't, uh, you know, just sort of gloss over that with with explaining just how wondrous this was. Uh, General Samuel C. Armstrong is the founder of the school. Um, he was a missionary kid. In Hawaii, he grew up in Hawaii, uh, the, the the son of a missionary uh, family. Um, he was an abolitionist and volunteered to fight for the North in the Civil War. Was a POW, uh, fought in Gettysburg. In fact, he was uh, one of the defenders against Pickett's Charge. I mean, like this guy was the real deal. Um, resigned his unit and volunteered to command the Ninth United States Colored Infantry. Now we just talked about that in a in a previous episode um, about uh, about the United States Colored Infantry when we talked about the Battle of Stones uh, River mm -hmm. um, in a previous episode, and I've got a blog post about uh, some Colored Infantry folks who are uh, buried in a cemetery near me. I'll I'll put that in the uh, the show notes. But bottom line is he established a school there for these you know freed black slaves who fought for the North. And ended up leading the 8th U.S. Colored Troops uh, during the Siege of Petersburg. In fact, they were some of the first troops in when the siege was broken. Um, and after the war, with a missionary organization, he establishes the Hampton Institute to train, as he said, the head, the heart, the hands. Mm -hmm. And now, this is where it gets really weird. He did not think blacks should vote. Now, let me explain. Um, in his mind, they weren't ready yet, and he thought that they needed a couple generations before they had been raised in society to have, um, you know, be developed for America's civilization, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And and despite that, which, uh, you know, I, I understand if anybody hears that and finds it hurtful and racist, but despite that, I'll just tell you that Booker T. Washington says in Up From Slavery, and this is the quote, I do not hesitate to say that I never met any man who, in my estimation, was the equal of General Armstrong. And one of the things that really impressed him about Armstrong was that he treated Southern whites, his former enemies, as people that he should serve, that General Armstrong should serve. And, and that was the model. Booker T. said, wait a minute, what if I'm just a service to all of these people? What if I make the, the institution that I'm creating here, a service to everybody. So when we train them, 
It's going to be training them for service to this area. And oh, by the way, that will make them very valuable, mm -hmm. right? That will make them very valuable and people that we want in the society. So, so that was his method was that we're, we're never going to do this thing without skilled labor that we're training people on. Uh, and, and again, for, for many reasons, right? The head, the heart, and the hands, all three of those have a role in, in what, uh, what Booker T and many others have called the dignity of labor. There's dignity. You have some self-worth and some worth to society because of the fact that you're willing to labor and, and do something to contribute. Uh, so I think that's the how that sort of made him say, you know, no, really, we need to be working here. This is this is part of what what I should be doing to educate you people is is there there has to be a labor, there has to be a skill, a trade that you're developing. So that's the how in a in a nutshell. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's the uh, we call it the uh, IKEA effect. Mm -hmm. Labor leads to love. Mm -hmm. so if I help build it, I take that much more pride in it. I, yep. you know, I, I I love it, and I'm very excited about it. And uh, and think about the parents of the you know the the grandparents uh, you know when they're telling their kids you know the the original you know students, and they're like you know the the grandkid comes home and says man college is hard yeah and then the grandparent can go oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> when I was in college we had to make the bricks build the building and then study for finals so I don't want to hear about your College is hard. <laughs> totally. I mean, some of the original students uh, got frostbite in their shanties because they're, you know, they just, they, they, they had to make their own beds. They had to make their own furniture. I mean, like they had nothing. They oh, had yeah. Absolutely... Those are great stories. Yeah. 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 I'm telling you, you don't, you don't have any idea what it was like. Exactly. Yeah. But so, at, at the same time, yeah, we see the the issues, right? At the time we're recording this, there's some protests on college campuses around the nation, and that is and they're tearing up buildings and and destroying property and stuff like that. And uh, to your point, yeah, would that be going on had they helped build those buildings? Uh, yeah, yeah, just uh, wow. Yeah. There, there's a thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know, I I get that there, are, you know here we are two white guys in 2024, you know, talking about what I guess technically is an issue about uh, an episode about race, but I, but I don't think that's the point here, right. For, for what you and I are, are pulling out of this, it's, it's um, getting an initiative that's important across the finish line. It's, it's seeing something done. And I, I do, I do know that Booker T Washington was uh, controversial in his day and is, uh, I guess, somewhat controversial now. I've, I've, uh, you know, in, in my reading in college, it was, you know, there was the Booker T. Washington approach, or there was the W.E.B. Du Bois approach, and the nation kind of collectively decided Du Bois approach would would be where, how we'd go to market, and 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 Booker T.'s approach not so much. Um, but I do just kind of look around, like you're saying, you know, I look at student protests, I look at the lack of skilled trades. I look at, you know, I ain't black. You may have noticed this, um, possibly the whitest person you've ever met. But you know, I'm I'm in Appalachia. I mean, I I know I know and and am friends with and relatives with people who are probably looked down on in society. And you know what helps you not be looked down on in society is when you have something of value, something of value that you bring. And so for him to have that mindset of like we're we're going to give you that. That's how we take you to market. That's how we literally take you to market, right? Uh, and, and make you a part of society and somebody that can can earn a living. Uh, to me, it just, uh, it makes so much sense. So, so he had that approach. And, and I, I would, I would argue that, you know, the, the goal there is that you have a model, you know, he, he mm -hmm. saw this work elsewhere. So he had, he had allies, he had the who, he had a model that was how he knew it, it was doable. Um, and then there's the last element, which is the why. You know, we we talk about that all the time. We talk about Simon Sinek's the golden circle and the idea of the the why can be the fuel, the motivation that drives uh, behavior. Um, so I, I I've got some quotes, if you will so you know indulge me to oh. share some Booker T's quotes here. Quote away, please. Thank you. Um, so. I, I guess, you know, 
I, I want to stress that I think a lot of what he's saying here, he's he's being very diplomatic. Um, and I think uh, maybe, you know, if we caught him in our day and age after the fact, he might have just said, yeah, of course, the whites were racist. Uh, but. I've, I've got a way of being conciliatory that helps everybody get along. And oh, by the way, I'm figuring out ways that we can uh, provide value to the community and earn money and have generational wealth and so on. So I think that's what he'd say. But here, here's the quotes. Um, this, this is the one that really got me. Uh, he says, many white people who had had no contact with the school and perhaps no sympathy with it came to us to buy bricks because they found out that ours were good bricks. Um, he says that it was a real want in the community. Mm -hmm. um, many of the white residents in the neighborhood, uh, you know, who might have thought, you know, Ooh, educating blacks, bad idea. They won't be worth nothing. He said, educating, they, they found that educating our students, it was adding something to the wealth and comfort of the community. It's good for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, we got acquainted with them, by the way, the whites in our, in our community. Uh, they traded with us and we with them. Our business interests became intermingled. We were interdependent with each other. We had something which they wanted. They had something which we wanted. This, in a large me measure, helped to lay the foundation for the pleasant relations that have continued to exist between us and the white people in that section and which now extend throughout the South. So I, I got a couple more quotes, but I mean, isn't that sort of a... a it's awfully clever. You know, it's it's awfully clever to just basically say, hey, what if we provided something you want, even if you hate us? Uh, maybe we'll we'd figure out how to to, you know, play nice with each other. Well, you think about, uh, you know, I think about my daughter and she was, you know, talk, thinking about careers and stuff like that. And I'm not sure where I heard it, but, you know, it's not my thought, but it, I, it resonated with me and it, it relates to this. I said, if, if you want to be valuable, if you want to have a career and earn money, find a problem and solve it. Yes. Yes. Right. right? Is the, is the, you know, is the problem that we, we need a wedding planner, right? We want the wedding yep. to go off well, and I need somebody to plan that. Is it an yep. event? Right. She's in that, that field. But yeah, in this case, you know, apparently there wasn't enough people making quality bricks. That's it. He found a problem. He solved it. And therefore, uh, derived value, right? His 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 people, his 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 people, his students, his his community uh, was seen as valuable. And, and I love your quote, right? Seen as equal partners in this, which was the which was the goal all that along. That was the whole goal, wasn't it? Right, right. <laughs> Equality, yeah, right. And so for them to be uh, seen that way, yeah, it's it's magical. And and the 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 perseverance to get from from point a to 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 that to that that, that final level uh where there was this kind of interaction in the community yeah yeah tremendous persistence tremendous grit yeah. determination willpower uh, staying focused on the vision yeah yeah that was crazy crazy cool so he he goes on to talk about uh, that we were even maybe dependent on some of those brick makers um he talks about, you know, the brickmakers that went out from Tuskegee to the rest of the South. Uh, he said, uh, uh, we find that he has something to contribute to the well-being of the community into which he has gone. Something that has made the community feel that in a degree it is indebted to him and perhaps to a certain extent dependent upon him. Um, so so that, you know, was a was a that, that didn't happen just because he showed up. Was he owed? Fair treatment. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. Were they going to give it to him? My guess is probably not. Uh, did he figure out a way to achieve it anyway? Right. It's like the circle of influence versus the circle of concern. Right. Mm -hmm. These brick makers just said, well, here's what I know how to do that will bring value here. And I think that if I do this well, it's going to grow. Um I'm not trying to make this a conversation about systemic racism or or Marxism or anything else that might be floating around nowadays. I'm just making a very obvious observation about the fact that, of course, there was a lot of racism. And of course, these gentlemen figured out how to overcome it. And ladies, by the way, there were there were women at the school, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, I just it it just blows my mind. He He ends this whole section 
Um, and I'll, just one more quote, I've got to, I've got to share it because it just, it fits in with, you know, a lot of our clients in the car business. It says, my experience is that there is something in human nature, which always makes an individual recognize and reward merit, no matter under what color of skin merit is found. I have found too, that it is the visible, the tangible that goes a long ways in softening prejudices. The actual sight of a first-class house that a Negro has built is 10 times more potent than pages of discussion about a house that he ought to build or perhaps could build. And the reason I love that is because you and I have been a part of initiatives where they've been tempted to send us in to give glorified lectures about how you ought to treat people right. And, and if you've worked in a car dealership for any length of time, you know that there's a very easy way to get treated uh, uh, with respect in a car dealership. And that is, uh, can you, can you go work? <laughs> Could you please go work? Can you go try to sell cars? Can you uh, try to write tickets? Can you try to uh, do the things that help this gigantic monster continue to run day after day? And I assure you, I think you and I've talked about this many times, you know, it doesn't matter what color your skin is. Uh, we will happily bring you in and promote you by the way. Um, the, the vast majority of car dealerships, I think, um, I, I have found that to be 100% the case. There is dignity in the labor. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's uh, as Booker T said, right? You're bringing value. That's it. For any human being, you know, if you want to be seen as, as worthy, then bring value. Right. Right. You know, and, and, and your point is, yeah, it won't be freely given, but it won't be given to anybody. Right. You know, you, you can be perceived as worthless. So no matter your race, your gender, your, yep. your whatever you know, thing you want to you want to throw out there. But yeah, if you bring in value, man, it's a whole lot easier to get the room's attention and to uh, to have society look at you as an equal. So year, years ago, I had a rural dealership, um, not super rural, but but, you know, out, outside of the city. And uh, they suddenly realized that they had um, a large uh, lesbian uh, customer base. And these are like, I mean, these guys are pretty, pretty redneck, you know? And, uh, and I was like, uh, why? You know, like I, I sort of ask openly, you know, what, how did you, how did this happen? And they really could not, there, there was no like moment that they knew about. They were just like, we, we try to treat everybody kindly. You know, we treat everybody fairly. Well, that was enough. You know, word got yeah. out. And and that was, uh, you know, that was a, a niche that they didn't even know they had uh, because they were willing to to be those kinds of people that treated people with dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it sort of that's almost the 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 marriage of the two parts of the story. Right. Like treating people with dignity and also bringing something of value. It turns out for that base of customers it was the fact that they were treated with dignity was the value mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just i just think there couldn't be enough said about that right now in our world I, I think that's that's part of why we're struggling um as americans right now is that we keep forgetting those things mm -hmm. yeah yeah to to know that the the, the person across from you has value and, and maybe it's not readily apparent uh, but with some discussion, some interaction, all of a sudden you're, you're, you find, okay, this person uh, could teach me something. hundred percent. There's something to be learned uh, from yeah. every interaction. That's right. That's right. Well, that's what I've got. I think if, if, if you're uh, trying to get an initiative going, if there's some change that you want to see for your organization, you know, who are the allies? Um, how are you going to do it? What's the model? And Keep your focus on your why. You know what's what's the thing that really uh, makes this a, a worthwhile endeavor. I think those are those are the things that I get out of Booker T uh, today. Come back tomorrow, and I'll tell you another genius insight. You know. Oh yeah, and you wonder if uh, if Booker's uh, kiln story inspired Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah, remember the scene? The king's talking to his son. And he's, he's like, you'll inherit all this land, right? In this castle. <laughs> you, you, you know, you know how hard it was to build this castle. I built the first castle. It sank into the swamp. I built the <laughs> second castle. It sank into the swamp. I built a third castle. It burned down, fell over, sank into the swamp. 
<laughs> we live in a swamp, right? But the fourth castle, the fourth castle stands. <laughs> I did not remember that at all. That is amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. There's wow. definitely, there's definitely a connection there. Yep, yeah, there has to be. I'm 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 tweeting John Cleese right now. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. See what he says. <laughs> the uh, uh, too much fun. Um, good points. Great stories. Uh, yeah, Booker T. Uh, yeah, uh, it sounds like you need to. Uh, the first is it wasn't his first book, but his most you know the book he's most famous for is, yeah. is uh, Up from Slavery, right? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, definitely should be on everybody's reading list. Oh. Hey, literally, top 10 greatest Americans of all time. I, I can't be wrong about that. Just just an amazing, amazing story. Hmm. That is awesome. That is awesome. All right. Speaking of uh, top 10 Americans. Oh, wait, wait. Before you say that, can I, can I make a plug? Sure. Tune in next week for our 200th episode. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. 200th episode. We can't believe that it's gone on this long, but I, you know, I don't know that we'll necessarily do anything really crazy, but I mean, my goodness, 200 episodes. It's insane. Next on an extra special Punky Brewster. Oh, wow. No, <laughs> well, now, now I'm singing the theme song in my head. Stop. Make it stop. <laughs> the, uh, all right. Back to speaking of great Americans, our announcer, uh, Mr. Wolf. Take it away, Mr. Wolf. So go ahead and tweet that. Or share it any other way you want. As always, there are no rights reserved, no trademarks, no copyrights. Share it if you want to. And join us next time on It Doesn't Take a Genius. That's good enough.